Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Communities Talk Prevention Success Stories webinar. And because it is National Prevention Week, happy National Prevention Week. Uh, this is our second year featuring real community prevention experiences during National Prevention Week. And I cannot tell you, but I am so glad that you're able to join us for what I know will be an energetic, a meaningful, and an absolutely interactive conversation. Uh, today's call will be recorded. My name is David Lamont Wilson, and I am a senior public health analyst at the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention at SAMHSA. And I'm also, I have the privilege of being the national coordinator for National Prevention Week. So during today's discussion, we will hear from community talk acti activity hosts who will share their prevention stories, including successes, challenges, and highlights. And in this discussion, you'll also learn from them why success stories are an important tool to showcase prevention efforts. And you'll learn also how preventionists across the country, country are implementing prevention activities right there in their communities. You'll also get to understand how they tailor prevention activities effectively for diverse populations. Uh, so now that I've talked about these wonderful panelists, I would love if they would uh, introduce themselves and tell us just a little bit, a little bit about the work that they do. And I would love to start with April Jones. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. April Jones, the Department Chair of Social Work at the illustrious Tuskegee University in Tuskegee, Alabama. A little bit about the work that I do as a Department Chair of Social Work is with field education, service learning projects in the classroom, and student associations, we reach out to the rural communities surrounding our campus. And so connecting with community talks for prevention education in the community is very key and vital in an area that is a resource desert. And so oftentimes the university is called upon to do prevention education and some intervention services. So what better way for social work students to start early giving back and putting their theoretical concepts into practice. So that's a little bit about what we do. And I'll tell you more about how we did this initiative a little bit later. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, can I hear from Dane next? Certainly, and that was a good segue because I'm also with the Department of Social Work at Ball State. Uh, and then I'm also the director for the Ball State Center for Substance Use Research and Community Initiatives and the director for a community academic partnership between Ball State and our local Muncie community to address substance misuse issues. Um, so a lot like April, we kind of harness the, the resources uh, and faculty expertise of the university to deliver prevention services both on campus and in the community. Um, we do a large number of services on campus um, from drug take back days uh, all the way up to community cleanup days, um, all the way to advocating for new services uh, in our school system. Uh, we've also developed a credential for uh, substance use prevention that actually mimics a lot of uh, an experience I had a long time ago as a, a certified prevention specialist uh, with SAMHSA when I was going through training there. Um, but I got, I'm really excited to get to talk a lot about that. That's a little bit about what I do. All right, thank you. Nicole, can we hear from you? Yes, hi, I'm Nicole Flickema. Um, I am the community health coordinator with the health department in Northwest Michigan. And I also am a project um, coordinator and a youth advisor for our local drug-free coalition, Safe in Northern Michigan, and I have been for the past eight years. Um, so our uh, coalition, Safe in Northern Michigan, um, it strives to prevent youth substance use uh, in our communities. So we serve um, Antrim, Shelby, and Emmett counties, which is in northern lower Michigan. Um, and we have a population of about 82,000 people. Um, so we're a rural community. Uh, we do have around 103 safe youth coalition members representing 11 school districts. And we have 25 um, active adult members. 
And SAFE um, in Northern Michigan, the name of our coalition, um, is a change agent in our community. So we did receive the Blue Ribbon Award from CADCA um, into 2022, which recognizes high performing coalitions um, that demonstrate measurable success in community level substance use outcomes. So we're really excited about that. And the um, community tax stipend is a small but important piece of the work that we do to achieve these outcomes in our community. Great. And last but not least, our last panelist. Hi, good afternoon. This is uh, Dr. Arnold Soriaga. I'm the assistant professor here at the Kilo College of Nursing, Christine Eileen, uh, at the Florida Atlantic University. I'm also part of the National Institute of Drug Abuse uh, Diversity Scholarship Network. I'm one of the 12 scholars for this year. And my research focuses on substance use, misuse and abuse in addiction. And last uh, couple of weeks ago, I was at Yale University uh, delivering a lecture on substance use disorder among other adults. But for this community talks, I was uh, invited to uh, do a community talk, uh, Let's Talk Prevention at the uh, Community Center here at Florida and Green Acres Community Center. So I'm excited to share that with you. So uh, here at FAU, we are also big on substance abuse. So we part of the opioid uh, initiatives so when we had this uh, break in uh, 2016, 2017. And until now, we are so active in community engagement. Thank you. And oh. thank you to all of our panelists. Um, and as you, we can already hear, we have a full range of experience, not only geographically, uh, but with the work that they do that is focused on substance abuse prevention. So to set the stage for our conversation, uh, I would like to give a short overview of SAMHSA's Communities Talk. Uh, next slide, slide eight. So across SAMHSA's Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, which we call CSAP, uh, multiple programs provide resources for substance use prevention, data collection, and analysis. And two examples of this are, of course, SAMHSA's National Prevention Week, which is an annual health observance dedicated to increasing public awareness of and action around mental health and substance use disorders, or what I like to say in short language, we like to showcase effective prevention from all across the country. And then we have Communities Talk, uh, which raises awareness and educates communities about the risk and the harms associated with alcohol and other drug misuse year round. Next slide. So Communities Talk is a SAMHSA program designed to support community-based organizations, institutes of higher education, and statewide or state-based organizations to host prevention events and activities, uh, mainly to get the conversation started. And these events raise awareness and educate communities about the harmful consequences of substance misuse, as well as underage drinking in youth and young adults. It also encourages communities to mobilize, to take evidence-based prevention actions. And since Communities Talk began more than 10 years ago, thousands of CBOs, IHEs, and statewide or state-based organizations have hosted prevention events. Uh, these slides following uh, provide some of the administrative details about Community Talk Works. Uh, next slide, Tim. So since 2021, Community Talk has been able to offer $750 planning stipends, and we will continue to do this in the future. And there are now 500 stipends of $750 each available every year. Uh, we used to do it every other year, but every year, CBOs and IHEs uh, need to act quickly when each new cycle is announced, since planning stipends are first come, first serve, and I believe there are only a few left uh, that people can apply for. And it is our hope 
that the annual availability of stipends will help communities carry momentum into their prevention efforts from year to year. Now, the next, uh, the next cycle will begin in January 2024. And of course, we encourage all organizations to continue their prevention work, even if they don't receive a stipend. Uh, next slide, 11. Communities Talk also has expanded to now include conversations about substance misuse uh, and prevention of substance use disorders, not just underage drinking, as opposed to just those years where it was solely focused on underage drinking. So to register, you'll need an email invitation from info at stopalcoholabuse.net. And once you have been invited, you'll want to complete your online registration and you can check out answers to frequently asked questions, as well as resources and materials to help you with your community's talk at activity at www.stopalcoholabuse.gov backslash community talk. Next slide. So today's event is all about these successful communities talk events that have been featured on our website and how they share their stories and elevate their prevention experience within their communities. That's what we're going to hear from today. Um, so again, I encourage you, in addition to what you're going to hear today, to visit that www.stopalcoholabuse.gov backslash communities talk backslash success stories to learn more. And hopefully um, you will get involved with our communities talk initiative and you will be able to add your success to our collection of stories. Now, I want to start what is the meat of what I think today's program is, which is hearing from our panelists. And so I have a list of questions that I want to ask to probe in our, in our conversation. And then later on in the program, we will have an opportunity to hear questions from our cyber audience. Um, so the first question that I am going to pose is, Will each of you share just a brief description of maybe your most recent Communities Talk activity? And uh, can I start with Dr. Jones? Certainly, uh, it's my pleasure to share. Our most recent Community Talk activity was at uh, the Macon County Middle School where we uh, observed Red Ribbon Week. And we talked about um, different types of um, alcohol and substance abuse um, that can take place among youth. And also we talked about how to prevent it, how to say no, how to tell someone, how to get to a safe space. I wish I could show you some pictures, but it was very engaging because many of the middle school students talked about using either uh, alcohol, drinking alcohol or vaping at an underage. And it was a relevant topic for the uh, teachers as well as the school bus drivers where well, apparently a lot of things occurred. So um, the Community Talks initiative, it works, is much needed, again, especially in an access, resource access desert where your university or some of your major companies are your resource. So it's making a difference. Are we were able to talk with the students, educate them, and the counselors were able to intervene with some type of uh, intervention to put a stop to the underage drinking and uh, uh, vaping use. Nice. So just so I'm clear, your, your primary audience was the school students? Yes, our primary audience for our most recent one was the middle school students at the request of the school for an activity. And our student who was in internship actually led that who was working at an alcohol and substance abuse prevention, intervention and treatment uh, agency. Nice. Very, very nice. Uh, next, let's have another panelist jump right on in. I guess we can just keep the original order going, make it easy. 
Um, so our event, we held our fourth annual Delaware County Symposium on Substance Use Disorders. Um, so it's kind of a benefit to have both the, the community academic partnership and the, the research center connected to this. So we held it on the Ball State campus where target audience was actually both uh, elected officials in the community as well as key administrators within the university itself. We had a unique situation where the university runs uh, the schools uh, in the community in which I live. Uh, so it's kind of like direct access to the schools through there and being able to advocate for prevention services. Uh, and then obviously also targeting college students um, uh, as well as teachers uh, uh, operating in some of the programs that we have there. Um, so we had a good turnout, had about 250 some odd attendees, uh, about 16 vendors, I think. Um, and so our goal was really to implement some environmental strategies. We happened to run it on St. Patrick's Day, which is a great day for prevention strategies for college <laughs> campuses. Um, also, though, uh, makes it a little bit more challenging for engagement sometimes. Uh, so we had some environmental uh, environmental strategies that we ran that had to do with uh, drinking and uh, as well as nicotine. Um, and then we spent uh, a large portion of the day communicating information uh, about some some of the activities that we've been working on as a coalition just to make the community is aware and to celebrate some of the successes um, that we've had in, in terms of our, our work in the community. So it was really a kind of a, a multifaceted approach that we were able to combine in, in one event to, to reach a, a really large audience, which was really exciting and really, really beneficial, um, both for the, the coalition and the research center. Very nice. Uh, Nicole. All right. Yeah. So for our community stock event this year, we actually had Ken, um, Kenneth Stecker. He's the Michigan Traffic safety resource prosecutor, um, and he presented at our local community college and provided a comprehensive update on Michigan's uh, marijuana laws. Um, and so we chose to focus on this because our um, marijuana is now our most prevalently used substance among high school youth in our area, um, and it surpassed alcohol use and nicotine uh, use through vaping um, among youth in 2022. So that's the first time that we've seen that. Um, since uh, we've been tracking, you know, youth uh, substance use data. And also Michigan, which has legalized medical uh, marijuana as of 2008 and adult use marijuana in 2018, um, has ever-changing landscape of products, regulations related to marijuana. And so we heard from law enforcement, school administrators, mental health providers, treatment providers, prevention pro providers that they are um, challenged, you know, with navigating this landscape and um, different in the changes that come along with it and express the need for more training. Um, and so they, um, so we hosted that and he was able to provide a comprehensive update on the legal um, aspects of marijuana in Michigan. That's awesome. And I'm gonna be saying this, I guess, for every question last but not least, Uh, on our part, uh, I did four recent events, but it are interconnected. Uh, one is in the field where we have the make a wish, make run, where we disseminate information about uh, ethanol and uh, underage drinking. Then after that, we have a community events. Uh, let's talk uh, substance abuse in the Green Acres Community uh, Center, at Green Acres, Florida. We have mothers and uh, uh, high school and middle school students attended the uh, town hall meeting about uh, substance uh, use, uh, particularly on uh, alcohol and cannabis or marijuana. Then we have a segue to the research of Na Southern Nursing Research Society conference in Orlando. We have thousands of uh, attendees there among academic and researchers. And also the other one is in Yale University among nurse practitioners program where they invited me to discuss about substance use in older adults. So have different age demographics that we try to target. But the highlights of this is in the community where we can feel the need of the community to educate them and inform them about alcohol. Where 50 people here in Florida in 2021 died under age drinking with alcohol related deaths. Uh, so that's alarming for our community. That's why we are uh, very concerned and uh, try to disseminate the information in the grassroots level. So in that way, we also go to the field where we have the event, the make a run where a lot of people there, uh, 
uh, different uh, ethnicities gathered uh, for the event, and then we shared the flyers that we have this community engagement or community education dissemination efforts. Wow. So I want you guys to think about, since all of you have conducted your events, um, give me one or what was the biggest highlight of your event and what, if anything, has that highlight led to any future changes or, or, or any future directions of your program that you could implement based on the highlight of your event? And before we jump into getting an answer to that question, I also want to encourage our audience, if you have heard something from any of our panelists that resonates a question within you, go ahead and put it in the chat. And then later, uh, when I start asking for audience participation, we'll have some things in the queue. Uh, April. Yes, thank you for that uh, loaded question. So <laughs> <laughs> we well, the high, there were so many highlights, but I think the highlight um, during this the past two years is seeing the aha moment or the knowledge transference of those uh, populations we serve, especially the middle school, not knowing that it was not okay to do some of the things they did or thinking it was a cool thing, not knowing some of the long term effects it could have on them mentally and physically. So I think that was the highlight of our moment beyond the students really getting into some of the skits they were doing that were really comical. Uh, so they really got to show their acting skills. And from that, we immediately were asked to join a, a local agency that was in the school to have an internship in the school system. And then from that, it grew to uh, the district asking, can we have more interns in all the schools in the area. Now, why that wasn't set up or why I didn't, I don't know. Uh, school social work is a popular thing and it's much needed. So I guess for us being busy academics, it realized that right in our backyard, we had, we had some access deserts ourselves that we needed to fill the gap. And so we have since uh, put together a plan and hope to launch fall, uh, fall 2023, our first a school social work internship program at all of the local schools in, in the county. Uh, so I think that's the nugget there, just pushing us to be in the community, be aware, be asked for help, and then thinking, hey, this is something we can, we can certainly do. Uh, so I'm proud to know that we found solutions that we were working in silos, and now we've come together to see it takes a village. And when you don't have resources, what we it's a win-win. We get something for student learning and they get something for support staff and those that can really relate to that age group in the school system. So I think that's the, a good turning point. Gotcha. Dane, um, let me rephrase the question so it's a little bit more clear. Uh, your main highlight or one of your main highlights, uh, has it led to any future directional changes in the program? Um, we actually, we kind of have two of them here. So uh, the first one is one of the big announcements that we made at this it, that affects both the community, the university, and, and hopefully a larger audience uh, was the, the successful completion of our Certified Prevention Specialist Associate course. So as part of our social work program, uh, we have ingrained uh, prevention work as part of the discipline. So if uh, we have a, a required practice course where if you complete it, uh, you are uh, able to take the certified prevention specialist exam and become credentialed as an associate through ICADA, which is Indiana's credentialing agency. Um, so we kind of have this belief now in our program that all of our social work students coming out need to have this training because um, after teaching the class for a long enough period of time, prevention work is is a specialized field with specialized knowledge. You can't just go out and jump into it without having that training. Um, so we've been working really diligently on putting this course together. So we were able to announce it and say that we're going to be able to make this available to the community and, and opened up a pilot for it. Also provided a, a annual scholarship that's going to be available to one of our community members to be able to participate in the course. Um, so it's really a paradigm shift 
uh, and looking at ingraining it as part of disciplines at that point, and not just in social work, but trying to do the same thing, say, with our teachers college, where we're advocating right now for them to receive uh, training on universal prevention programs as part of their integral coursework um, to where every teacher that came out of the university would have prevention knowledge and skills um, specific to the things that we learn as certified prevention specialists. Uh, I mean, because I can't even imagine that for, for those of you watching how much easier your work would be if everybody that you came in contact with already knew about the strategic prevention framework and what was working and what didn't work. And we just had evidence based practices everywhere. Um, so that's really the goal of looking at it. And with our university being connected to our schools, it really is kind of examining if we can get this going in our community. Is this what community prevention work should look like if we can get it in teaching? in nursing, in social work, in all of the helping disciplines. Um, so that was that was the first major one that we're just extremely excited about. The second one, though, is that uh, I think somebody in our in uh, the audience was listening when we were talking because we, we got approached pretty quickly afterwards about bringing in uh, uh, or applying for uh, a very large grant to bring new universal prevention programming to the school, um, which we're currently working on. Uh, so uh, there's two just gigantic wins uh, that came out of that just, uh, I mean, pretty quickly after the event happened. So uh, a lot of good stuff happening uh, from the event. That's absolutely great. And those were, you gave us a lot of nuggets there. Uh, Nicole. Your biggest Sorry. highlight Thanks. and how has that highlight translated into some future directions of the program? Yeah, so um, I think our biggest highlight was just the connection that was made between our presenter. Um, so Ken Stecker, who is the Michigan um, Traffic Safety Resource Prosecutor and our local law enforcement. And so he has a lot of um, obviously, knowledge, obviously knowledge on uh, Michigan marijuana laws, driving under the influence of marijuana. And so he did... Um, let all of our local law enforcement know if they come across a case or if they need any clarification on the law, um, that he'd be happy to assist them with that. And so just having those connections and learning more um, and having that resource for them was um, a, a major highlight, I would say. All right. And of course, last but not least, your biggest highlight and and what did that highlight do for any future directions in the program? I think uh, after that uh, conversation with the community uh, top at the Grand Acres, uh, we identified the needs of the community and uh, we are writing a post uh, proposal uh, for a grant uh, to educate and to disseminate information and for prevention application of that. But one thing led to the other that with, when I published an article in the Journal of Nursing Scholarship uh, about cannabinoids at that in Florida, along with the synthetic cannabinoids, uh, 12 uh, uh, major outlets approached uh, and carried over the news uh, about the cannabis, cannabis and then the adverse effect, especially to the young people. So which is very impactful because even in Sun Sentinel here in Florida, it was a front page uh, a news report, and it was featured our articles, our, our FAU articles on cannabinoids, the one we shared with the community about what to look for when you are when your friends or family member that you know of is taking these medications that they can co-use with alcohol or whatever substances, it could have a harmful effect, including death. So that is one of the highlights. And then segue to that, a lot of uh, clinicians are aware of how, what to look for in a client with substance use disorder or those who are at high risk of developing adverse effect from the use of a substance such as cannabis or ethanol. Thank you. Well, it seems like all four of you were proud of uh, some of the outcomes that came from your community's talk activities. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on, were there any challenges or is there anything that you would do differently? Um, and let me start with April. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, I think we probably had challenges with um, planning, with um, 
so many diverse needs and who to target to be um, the, the recipient of the services where um, some could come to some of the events and some couldn't. So we did problem solve having some in-person and hybrid events so anyone was well, welcome to come. Okay. So that's it for us. All right. Is there anything that you would do differently, Nicole? Um, uh, no. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, April. Do you want to do no, more? No, you asked me if there's anything I would do differently. Um, no, there isn't. Uh, oh, I thought you said Nicole. I did. I'm sorry, Nicole. Oh, you did. Okay. I um, did. You did. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think one of the, I don't know that I do anything differently. One of the challenges that we faced in our community, uh, what is just that our, our local law enforcement, um, departments, they have typically only one person on duty at any given time. And so, you know, that it's challenging, um, for them to give up that person to attend a training. Um, but it, it was made a priority. Um, and so I know it was challenging and it had to happen kind of, you know, it, it was challenging for them to do that, but they did make it a priority and, um, all of our local law enforcement departments, uh, were able to send someone. Nice. Um, Dane, since you're connected to a college or university, is there anything that you would do differently? And outside of that setting, did you have other partners like Nicole? Um, so I think I mentioned earlier that I would not host it on St. Patrick's Day again. <laughs> yeah, um, it just the parking itself was was a problem. Um, there's uh. So we actually have really good engagement with um, just off campus part. We had at our event, we had representation from almost all 12 sectors of the community. So we had the police department, the mayor was there, some uh, city council members. Um, uh, we, uh, we, as part of the coalition, we have an advisory board that has, that has all of that group kind of contained. And fortunately, we're able to give them a shout out at the event that usually draws them in for a large portion of it because we don't tell them when it's going to happen. So, um, so we do have a large amount of engagement. We have a lot of service providers that come out. Um, and because we do so much community work, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's really good. In fact, that's one of the highlights of a lot of the work that we get to do is the level of community engagement we have um, with all of the different, uh, different stakeholders. I will say one of the interesting things about that, which um, can be kind of a challenge sometimes, but um, also a huge benefit is oftentimes in prevention or recovery or treatment, we operate in silos, uh, which when you're not talking and your systems aren't connected within a community, can be extremely problematic uh, when you're going in different directions. So at these symposiums, we bring everybody together. Um, I mean, we had our uh, director, of the, even the state director for prevention was there, um, along with representation from recovery and treatment. And, and when we start talking about these topics and going in different directions, obviously preventionists sometimes have differing opinions from uh, people who are uh, harm reductionists. Uh, but it's really, really important to have all of these people in the same room and kind of align strategically if you're going to make changes in communities, um, which is one of the, the key elements of what we were doing with our community engagement is making sure that this wasn't just prevention, um, you know, obviously with, uh, with the setting that I like to, to operate in, but that we had professionals from across, you know, the different disciplines so that everybody understands where we're going and can assist each, each sort of component of the system in trying to get to that final goal of reducing, uh, reducing substance use and reducing the harms caused by substance use in the community. All right. So our, our last panelist, I want to answer this question, and then I'm going to start infusing some of the questions that I've received from the audience. And I may just call on one or two of you uh, to answer some of the, the uh, audience questions. Well, for me, I think um, if you analyze it deeply, uh, talking to the community members, to the monitors, and then to the students, uh, there is um, 
a need uh, for the community to be more aware of what substances our kids are engaging in, especially like uh, marijuana, because their perception of the risk lowered over time. They think it's safe because now we have the medical use of uh, marijuana, but in yet they are having some synthetic cannabinoid exposure in the community. And we have a lot of vaping stores around the campuses, high school, middle school, and they have access to, to this uh, 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 places and the risk uh, is there uh, really because of the deaths that we experience here in Florida. So uh, we want we want to engage with the school nurses and their collaborations. I agree with Dane. It's uh, it's like a lot of stakeholders uh, involvement uh, to uh, reduce avoidable deaths from these substances. So we identify the needs, and that's why our efforts are ongoing to disseminate, not only disseminate, but to affect the change that we want to see in our community. And our goal is to have a safer community out there so we can see people doing basketball or just the, 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 the activities that are more uh, uh, productive for the kids instead of uh, uh, spending time with uh, taking substances. So that's what we want to see in our community. So the work there is enormous and we are here to respond to at least reduce the deaths. Oh, absolutely. Um, I have my first question from the audience, and this one is for Dr. Jones. Um, our audience member has said, has she seen any changes in community attitudes about underage drinking and cannabis use as a result of their internships and presence in your school system? Um, I guess I can give an opinion. We don't have um, data driven, so we haven't actually took surveys or anything like that. But I would say yes, I'm joining a community meeting tonight to talk about the alcohol and substance use issues and the need for change. And it was as a result of some things we've already done in the community. Of course, with students, they always get insight to, wow, you know, um, their drinking or substance uh, exploration, as I would call it, <laughs> the need to change now being one of those persons who wants to sit on the other side of a desk and help someone else with that same issue. So I think, yes, uh, in, in an opinion form. Okay. I have a question for Dr. Suriaga. What would you what would you advise others in terms of working with local media? We'll launch our uh, we'll launch our first poll. Um, I'm going to repeat the question one more time. Uh, what would you advise others in terms of working with local media? I mean, uh, working with local media about uh, substance use, especially uh, the cannabis or marijuana, is that we have to provide them with the evidence about what really is happening in our community. So we identify the need, like us, for instance, here in Florida, we have identified that three more than 300 people died uh, from the use of cannabinoids and synthetic cannabinoids here. So among age group 18 to 24, 34 to 44 years old, most uh, of the of the deaths. And we highlight the results of our research. These are research-based, evidence-based that can inform the public so they can have a better decisions, yes, when this is used for some medical reasons, like your pain or nausea and vomiting, weight loss, or uh, to improve appetite, but yet there's some risk involved about the substance. Uh, so, in communicating with the uh, with the media, so we need to inform the public both uh, the pros and the cons of a substance, but we will also be informing them of the adverse effect like death or emergency room visits or hospitalizations due to drug intoxication. So it should be evidence-based and also be research-based. Thank you. You're welcome. Nicole, I have a question for you. Um, an audience member has said you have a large youth coalition. How involved are they in your program planning and how were they able to, how were you able to attract uh, them to prevention? Okay, great question. Yes, so we do have um, a lot of youth coalition members. So this, our communities talk activity was specifically, um, a, I would say more of an adult coalition or the adult uh, coalition members, um, they had heard from other professionals in the community about the need for more education around Michigan marijuana laws with 
other professionals in the community. And so this was more targeted for adults, but our youth coalition do all the planning and um, and development of like our media campaigns and youth centered activities. So anything that's targeting youth is developed and designed by our youth. Good. It's always good to hear. I yeah. seem to have um, comments from the audience that evolve around uh, one person has said, I find that educating all ages on how the emotions and feelings affect the mind and thoughts that can settle or affect the physical. Uh, so I was going to ask Nicole and Dane um, to respond to that uh, around a holistic view related to prevention. Dane, do you want to start? Now, will you repeat the, the comment one more time just so I can process it a little bit better? So the comment was, I find that educating all ages on how the emotions and feelings affect the mind uh, and how they can also affect the physical. Holistic approach to empower healthier choices or behaviors. And so... I was I was thinking that maybe you and Nicole um, have a holistic view in terms of that comment on how how to relate that to prevention. I can say in looking at that, if you're talking about it sounds sort of like emotional regulation uh, and having that impact mind and body and then obviously tying it into substance use. So actually one of the, the key things that um, I, I discussed with college students and when we talk about discussing things with youth uh, regarding marijuana use. Um, so marijuana use oftentimes is used to mask emotions. It's a way of dealing with stress and a way of dealing with uh, potentially you know, stressful home situations uh, for youth that, that can then spiral out, out of control as you get older. Um, but what we've seen is that, um, for instance, for youth that aren't able to necessarily process um, some of these emotions in a healthy way and start using marijuana at an early age, um, particularly in the primary age where we're trying to prevent uh, early substance use, uh, you end up having that turning into a primary coping strategy for the youth as they get older. Uh, and so then you hit 25 and all of a sudden you see somebody that has to use marijuana every single day just to get through life. And while we don't necessarily classify it in the same vein of addiction as, you know, like um, opioid use or something like that, where the physical withdrawal effects are just gigantic, uh, you can find people that have been emotionally crippled by by like long term marijuana use that started as an early age, because that is their coping strategy and that is their primary way of dealing with life. Um, so I, I think that kind of speaks to at least part of what the comment was getting at, but mm -hmm. that's the danger in this that I really like to highlight is that, well, it's not the physical addiction. Uh, it's, it's almost like a, a developmental disability that you're, you're facilitating in terms of your emotional and cognitive health as you grow older, uh, when you start at such an early age and it becomes a, a primary part of, you know, who you are as a person and how you deal with life. So. Thank you. Nicole, did you want to add anything to that or any of the other panelists? Um, you know, I I think just I think um Dane did an awesome job with that. And I don't have anything to add right now. Thank you. Cool. Maybe so I think can add the uh, you know the College of Nursing at FAU, we have a holistic nursing approach to uh, dealing with emotions, psychological, or any aspects of uh, the person's uh, uh, life. So um, one way that identified is also the need for communications where people are so afraid to talk about substance abuse, even with the kids. I said, I want to help my friends, but I could not uh, reach out. What language would I use? So here at FAU, we have the first language we advocate for that, the caring language that people, instead of calling them addicts, we can call them persons with uh, drug issues or drug problems or uh, challenges. Uh, instead of calling them alcoholics, we have the persons with. So we have to reframe their way of thinking on how to call their classmates or their colleagues or their friends. Uh, 
if they have been issues or they've been manifesting some signs or emotional distress symptoms related to the substance use. So we try to reframe them how to do it, approach it holistically, not only physiologically, but how to deal emotionally and how to express their help with other colleagues or classmates. Thank you. So because we're coming to the near the end of our program, I wanted to give two final questions to our panelists. Um, and the first question is, I know I've asked you about what you were most proud about uh, for your community's talk activity. I would love to know what you're most proud of when it comes to your prevention work in your community. And we will start with Dr. Jones. Thank you. I think I'm just most proud of being a part of the solution uh, for prevention education and being the change that the community has needed for quite some time. Okay. Uh, Dane. I think it's um, hopefully going to be uh, the increase in some of the environmental strategies that, that we're using in our community uh, and doing some community outreach. I'm in a very, very high risk uh, community um, and with a, a low number of resources, uh, which is great for being able to build things up um, and exciting to see the change, but makes the work really, really meaningful too uh, from where you're at, so. Nice. Nicole. I would say I'm most proud of our youth, um, our youth coalition, because there's no way we could have as much of a reach or an impact without them. Um, so we do, they just reach all of the students within their schools um, and really are living, breathing role models for um, a drug-free life. And so um, they mentor younger students and are really respected and looked up um, in our communities. And I'm really proud of them. Thank you. Dr. Yeah. Yes, I'm proud of our uh, committee stakeholders, not only us researchers, that we are able to uh, disseminate or share what we know about the uh, substance use and the uh, adverse effects, but uh, to empower them to make uh, informed decisions on how to keep their community safe uh, from substance use and also to save lives for those people, especially those who are really struggling uh, uh, with the substance uh, uh, use. Uh, we don't want them to have disorders from using the substances for many reasons, but to keep them safe. So we are proud of them that they're taking efforts to, to reach out to us if they need someone to educate them or to uh, inform them about any other events in the community that we are here to help them. So we're proud that we are become partners with the community uh, leaders. Awesome. Uh, so my last question before I start uh, closing out is a question that I always love to ask, especially from um, individuals who are as seasoned and as passionate as you guys are. Um, what would be one piece of advice that you would share to the audience as they work on their prevention efforts? Dr. Jones? I would say remain optimistic and energized to um, be the change and be a part of the change you want to see. And Dan? It's to always keep in mind that we're utilizing our skills to facilitate what the community is telling us, um, that as a prevention professional, that the, the strategies and the interventions that we use uh, are coming, need to be designed and worked hand in hand with community members to really address their problems. Because um, you can't do prevention work effectively without that community buy-in and community engagement piece, um, which, which you know, I've seen happen now at the college and, and at the community level. So it's, it's the community engagement has to come first to be successful in prevention. Mm. Good piece of advice. Nicole. Yeah, I would just add to what Dane said also, you know, like no message about us without us. Um, 
you know, it's especially with the youth. And I know someone asked earlier about how we grow our youth coalition. So I think really it just, it just takes one youth um, to get involved and then just promote the coalition and, um, and share that. And then they'll kind of grow it for you. Nicole, do you have that trademarked? I love that. I I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I, th- I feel like it's just no kind of message about us. No message about us without us. I love that. I don't know where I heard you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. For those who uh, want to do this uh, prevention uh, strategies, uh, SAMHSA has a lot of resources. If you go to the website, actually, uh, they give you ideas on how to uh, reach out to the community, to uh, connect with the community leaders and identify problems, especially with uh, alcohol, underage drinking, and cannabis use. Uh, and also, research from a university don't hesitate to partner with the local community and we can identify the needs by talking and working together. I think the message is strong that uh, we have enormous problems in our society and each one of us has a key role to play. So I think that's a good message to share with everyone who is interested to promote this prevention efforts. And I really do appreciate the mention of SAMHSA resources um, because I'm going to throw a a slight segue or a slight follow-up to that. Um, I assume all of you use uh, some of our Communities Talk materials for your event. And I wanted to know, especially from you, Dr. Siriano, um, which which, uh, Communities Talk materials were most effective for you. And then if anyone else from our panelists wanted to uh, speak to our Communities Talk materials. This uh, substance use disorder, when I have a training award from NIDA, I use uh, some uh, material uh, before the, the community talk. There's a video, uh, be the wall uh, in Florida here uh, to limit alcohol use. And during our, our clini- clinical uh, rotations with nurse, uh, nursing students, we share the videos with the students about substance use and what to look for, the effects not only physical, but also emotional, psychological, to our clients when they deal with people with substance use disorder in the community, with their mental health rotations, so to educate our future clinicians. And also, when I start uh, reviewing the the data from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement about those people who died from substances, I use your tip, tips and resources, wherein you have to say assessment, and in that assessment to say, use uh, data, uh, especially local one, that can connect with our community here. So when they see people in this county have these deaths or what substances are really have some uh, problems with the community, they can connect with it. They said, oh, I want to protect my community, our, our counties from this. And like us, Broward County, Palm Beach County, Miami-Dade. So we have a lot of issues with substance use. So uh, uh, using the tips from SAMHSA website, uh, tips and assessment helps me a lot to ground my efforts on what really matters most to our community. So if this is the deaths that we can talk about, and then medical examiners saying that we have problem with our youth uh, using uh, cannabis, how many people died actually, and who are they? So knowing where they are uh, uh, really helps me by reading the tips. I said, okay, it gives me a aha moment that this is a good uh, uh uh, focus area for my research. So thank you. Thank you for the tip. Thank you. And so if we could jump to my last slide, I believe it's slide 14. Um, as we close, in the spirit of talking about resources, um, it would be criminal of me not to mention the wonderful podca- podcast series Uh, that we have around Communities Talk. And I would invite all of you um, to to watch and listen to that podcast series because as as we have our four panelists here who are sharing their success, uh, you will be able to hear a lot more success uh, from our Communities Talk series, and also some ideas and strategies uh, that hopefully will be beneficial to you as you continue your prevention work, your prevention journey. 
Um, I also would like to re-emphasize that we have resources to share at our www.stopalcoholabuse.gov uh, website. And of course, since uh, this is National Prevention Week, I would also like to share that we would love for you to visit um, the National Prevention Week website, uh, which is www.samsa.gov uh, backslash prevention hyphen week, uh, so that you can get involved with National Prevention Week moving forward and also learn about the new approach that we have to National Prevention Week, which is we are aiming to showcase prevention success all throughout the year, not just during this one week in May. And so we will be calling on, on programs and coalitions and grantees who we see are doing great work in the prevention field. And we want to share that work and that success nationally with everybody. And that will be the new focus and approach of National Prevention Week. Again, I would love to thank our panelists for their insights, uh, for their time, of course, and uh, for the valuable tips that they have shared with all of us around Communities Talk. And I invite our audience and thank you for being there with us and to continue to hear from us as we are doing more work uh, to help you do the work that you're doing on the ground. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day.